We are in a, in a kind of a series around fruitfulness. Uh, Isaiah 54, sing, O barren woman. Um, God has called you to be incredibly fruitful. Nobody wants to touch you because you're barren, but actually I will be your covenant partner and make you fruitful. And you'll forget the shame of your youth, the disgrace of your past, and the humiliation of what it means to be barren because I'm going to come and make you fruitful because I am your husband, not just your father, your husband. I will be one with you and I will come and dwell with you and I will make you fruitful. And so this is the, the text that we have had over and over again as a church. And part of the response to that is, it, it says there, it says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch wide your tent curtains. And th that idea of stretching wide your tent curtains means open your front door as wide as possible. Get ready to, to increase the inflow of people, which is why we started an evening service. We are not, we are in, in Durban, evening services don't do well. But when God says do an evening service, we just do what he says. So that's why we're doing it. And we're opening wide our, wide our tent curtain and we're trusting God for increase in the morning and evening services to see what God wants to do. And uh, we're looking at, and part of that as well is increase the place of your tent. Increase the place of your tent. It, it's, it means increase the area in which your house is built on. So it used to be on, on one hectare, now it's on three hectares. That's the kind of idea, the picture that it's trying to portray. And so we are, we've got a couple in the, in the Elveston area who is opening their home to start something there. So we, I felt God a number of months ago say, I felt God woke up one morning and felt God said plant in Elveston. Now Elveston is by Asagar, that kind of area. And so we are, we are we, we're literally going to start acting on this. It's this text that said, open wide, increase, think big, don't hold back. And uh, so we're going to start acting on these things and begin to see what God wants to do. So come along, pray for us, be on the journey with us, and allow God to do not only in us, but in you what he wants to do. So that's why we're going through the series of fruitfulness. What does it mean to be fruitful? What does it look like? And how do we become more fruitful as a people? And uh, with that comes this idea right through the scriptures as, uh, that God keeps, speaks in, uh, in the scriptures in, in agricultural terms. He kind of, he talks about us as being a field. And in this field of life that we have, it's kind of this, we have the soils and the, all these different parables. And it, it's like we're a field and, he, and he's created this field to be fruitful. And in the, in the beginning, in the, in the Genesis chapter 1, he says to Adam and Eve as he's in his creation, he says, he says he blesses them. He says, be fruitful, now multiply and fill the earth and bring chaos, bring chaos back into order. And he says, go into all the world and do this and bring, I want you to be a fruitful people. He blesses them and says, be fruitful. And so this idea right, comes right from page 1 of the Bible. This idea of God creating humans to be fruitful. And when humans decide to go it on their own and reject God and, and, and push God away and, and, and step away from the source of their fruitfulness. You see, it's God blessed them and said be fruitful. When you step away from the source of the blessing that enables you to be fruitful, then you say, well, I can do this on my own. I want to be like God. I can be God. Then God says, okay, well, if you want to do that, then go into the world and be fruitful by yourself. And so there's this, this, this disruption in the relationship with God and humanity happens. But right at that moment, God already comes up with a plan to restore that. And in Christ, God restores our fruitfulness, friends, as a people. And uh, we've got to have a, an incredible expectation that God has called us to be fruitful. And when I say fruitful, I'm not talking about having lots of money only. Some people will have that. When I say fruitful, I'm saying carrying the life of God and all that that brings. Carrying the Spirit of God, carrying the fruit of the Spirit, carrying the character of God, being a vessel for God to use uh, in the gifts that He's given us. Uh, it's being fruitful, multiplying, carrying the seed of God and passing the seed on. It's, it's, it's in all its various forms. It's not limited to being you living your best life with lots of money and the prosperity gospel. It's not that. 
Do, do we want God to bless us financially? Yes, we do. Do we go, want God to protect us and provide for us? Yes, we do. But I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about all of life, prosperity, fruitfulness. And it says in John chapter 15, verse 16 in the New Testament, obviously, John. So you did, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So there's the idea that God chose us to be fruitful. You did not choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and be fruitful. John chapter 15 is the text where Jan spoke about abiding in him, and unless you abide in him, you can't be fruitful. It's this idea that God has appointed us for fruitfulness. Romans chapter 7 verse 4 to 6 says this, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to one another, to another. To him who was raised from the dead. Sorry, I read that badly. So brothers and sisters, you died to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. You died to the law so that you'd belong to God and belong to through Christ, the one that it says that you belong to another who was raised from the dead, so that we would bear fruit for God. The idea that is if you're in Christ, we're fruitful. God expects that, and we've got to expect that of our lives, friends. The transforming power of God comes into the human heart and changes us, into, changes us from barrenness to fruitfulness. It's that simple. It's not complicated. But we've got to have an expectation of that. God can change us. God does want us to be fruitful. And when we go through, we're going to talk about what it means to go through a season now. For when we, it carries on in verse 5, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore the fruit of, for death. The problem with the law is it produced fruit, but it produced the fruit of death because it didn't have the power to change us. That's why God fulfilled the law in Christ. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the, new, in the old way of the written code. So we, life in the Spirit means fruitfulness. It means freedom. It means fruitfulness. Freedom without fruitfulness is not freedom. You get that? You can say, well, I'm free, 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 free. If there's no fruitfulness there, if there's no spirit of God there, if there's no life of God there, if there's no character of God, fruit of the spirit there, it's not real freedom. It's, 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 it's this unbelievable p power of fruitfulness that God wants to release in our hearts. And so we have this picture of us being a field and the father being a farmer and God farming our hearts. And I use the illustration of regenerative farming. My niece is into regenerative farming on their farm. And you use, and the, the idea of regenerative farming is understanding the, the existing soils and existing seeds and existing weeds and existing things there and using that to your benefit and so that you don't have to put foreign matter into the soils and foreign things, fertilizer and that. You use existing things to do that. And God is an amazing regenerative father, uh, farmer. Because he will use existing circumstances and existing things, good things and bad things in our lives for our sake so that we can become more fruitful. He is an incredible regenerative farmer. And this fruitfulness that he works in us is a process, friends. It's farming. It takes time. It takes time to build a crop. It takes time to have a harvest that it reaches its full potential. Because we're learning and we're adjusting and we're with the Father. And he's teaching us about to hear his voice. And he's giving us faith to step into new areas. And he's, he's teaching us. He's our Father. And right, what we do is we see in the New Testament that there's two big ideas that account for fruitfulness. Seed and soil. Seed and soil. And we see this 
very clearly through the parable of the sower. And I spoke about that yesterday to the men. And I'm not going to speak about it again, but I'm just going to say seed in the soil. And he says the seed is the word of God that we sow, and the soil is our hearts. The climate is exactly the same. The conditions are exactly the same. The rainfall is exactly the same. The seed is identical. The only difference, the word of God is the word of God. The difference is the soil. The difference is the condition in which the seed lands. And there's different soil conditions. There's a hard heart. There's a, there's a shallow heart that it lands in and it is easily choked out when pressure comes. And then there's the, the, there's the overwhelmed um, kind of with the th- uh, thistles and weeds. And it says the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth comes in and, and chokes the life of God out of, out of people. And he says actually, but good soil when you, when, you, when you receive the word of God, when you accept it, you produce 30, 60, and 100-fold fruitfulness. Seed and soil. Seed and soil. Seed is the word of God. And friends, I, I, this is so um, kind of quite basic, but actually quite a big thing. The reason why the word of God is so important, friends, and when I say the word of God, I'm talking about the Bible. And then the words of God, the prophetic words that come, that align with the Bible, that come alongside the Bible and speak into our situations, the rhema words of God. The reason why the word of God is so important, and Isaiah 55 says this, he says this, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Okay? He says that on one side. On this side, he says, my word always bears fruit. My word always accomplishes the, the, the thing for which I sent it for. Always. It always will bear fruit. If my word will stand. The reason why we need the word of God, friends, is because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. The way we get his thoughts and his ways is through his word. And if we don't get his word, we get the world's ways and culture's ways. And thoughts. We get a different envi- the environment's thoughts and ways. The season in which we are in this world's ways, rather than the truth of the word of God, which is true, which will bear fruit. And so the word of God, the seed, is incredibly important in our fruitful process. But what I want to talk about this morning is the soil. And this is so, so key. Because the Word of God comes from God, and we've got, to, we've got to know the Word of God, and that's why we've got to know the Bible, and we've got to know what God's saying, and we've got to be in community to know the Word of God. We study the Word of God in community. Don't go have some kind of tangent, hey, the Word of God says this, and some tangent, and some... We, we, the Word of God is, is, a, is a very powerful and effective seed that when it lands in the right soil, it has incredible fruitfulness attached to it. But the soil is incredible. The soil is the thing that's different in our fruitfulness pro- process, according to the, the parable of the sower. It is incredible that in the parable of the sower, he never mentions seasons. It's always seed and soil. He never mentions the, the season that you're in. I remember Justin Fasaki coming to me a number of years ago now, saying, Stan, it's not about the season, it's about the soil. And what happens is, friends, when we go through a tough season, we blame the season, and we blame and we look at all the externals to change, when in fact I think God is wanting us to plow and to fertilize and to work our soil you see the word of God the seed of God and the soil of our hearts prepared to receive the seed of God will be fruitful in any season if we understand what fruitfulness is you might go through a tough financial season but still be fruitful 
the life of God flowing through in and through you. You see, the condition of our hearts, friends, is more important than the season we're in. Don't look at the season we're in. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at the Word of God. And ask Him about the soil of our hearts. And what we can do to make the soil of our hearts right. That it's not hard, that it's not shallow, and it's not choked. So that we can receive the Word of God and be fruitful. That's the life of faith. The life of faith is believing that the seed is enough when I receive it to to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. In fact, friends, the greatest revelation of who you are and who God is will come in the toughest of seasons. Because it's in the toughest of seasons that God takes away the options, removes options. You've only got Him. Or you've got yourself. So you can press into yourself or you can press into him. Press into your own resources or press into his resources and who he is. You see, it's in in the tough seasons that you dig deep. We don't just live on the surface 10% of the iceberg of our lives. We actually go deep into the bottom 10% or 20% that nobody ever gets to. And it's in that place that God deals with our hearts to make us ready for fruitfulness, for a season of incredible fruitfulness, friends. I think we should always be fruitful. But I think there's almost seasons where God makes us doubly and triply. Well, it's 30, 60, 100. We should always be fruitful. But there's seasons of 30, 60, and 100. And there's a season that God can, we can expect us to be a hundredfold. Fruitful. There's this expectation that God wants to do something. So let's look at a couple of texts in the New Testament about the soil. And then I want to give you an illustration. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 to verse 20 says this. Watch out for false prophets. He's talking about false prophets and false teachers. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do not pick grapes from thorn bushes. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Ah. You see, good or bad, at the root of our human heart, at the root of our good or bad humans, you would say it's the root. You wouldn't say it's in their roots like a tree would. You'd say it's in our hearts. They're saying actually at the heart of the per- you can't, you, you've either got good or bad, but, but, the, but you recognize people by their fruit. Is it an apple tree? Well, are they bearing apples? Is it an orange tree? Well, are they bearing oranges? You know what they are by what they bear, by the fruit. And the thing that makes them bear one or two, one or the, whatever it is, is the condition of their heart. A tree is, a tree is identified by the, by the general populace out there, by the fruit it produces. Next text, Luke chapter 6, verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick pigs from thorn bushes or grapes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Again, it's this text of, actually, the the, the heart of the matter is the heart. It's the soil of the heart. It's out of the the overflow, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is the wonderful indicator of fruit? It's what comes out of your mouth. 
Can I say what comes out of your mouth in private and in public and in private? When you buy yourself, what comes out your mouth? What are you saying to yourself? What are you screaming out there? That is a direct correlation to what's in your heart. See, for us to move into a season of fruitfulness, we've got to listen to what's coming out of our mouths and ask God to adjust us. A good or bad person, a good or bad, the, the fruit of a good or bad person comes from what is stored in their hearts. What about this next one? All three of these texts saying similar things. Matthew 15, verse 10. Jesus called a crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile him. But what comes out of their mouth is what defiles them. Peter said, explain this parable to us. Are you still so dull? Imagine Jesus saying that to you. We think Jesus is like such a nice guy. Imagine sitting around him and saying, yeah, it's not what goes into you that defiles you, it's what comes out of you. And you say, but hey, Jesus, please can you just explain that to me? But are you still so dull? Are you still so doff? The standard Afrikaans version. Jesus asked them, don't you see whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a, mouth, a person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. Radical. Chantal brought a word this morning saying God wants to deal with our hearts. Verse 19 says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. It's like the most clearer, most, it's the clearest of the three. Out of the heart come these things. So for us to bear fruit, the seed is important, but the soil of our hearts, friends, either accepts that and produces the 30, 60, 100. And when fruit of murder, adultery, sexual immorality, and the Bible says murder is talking badly of somebody. Jesus takes it to that level. Takes sexual adultery and sexual immorality to looking at a woman lustfully. Remember, this is, I'm not, you can say, oh, it's that, I'm not a murderer, and I'm not an adulterer. I'm, I'm talking about, let, let the Holy Spirit in this season get hold of our hearts so that the seed of God can penetrate our hearts and make us incredibly fruitful ministers of Jesus. Make us incredibly fruitful sons and daughters of God. It's so important, friends, what you let into your hearts. I've said this three times every time I've preached on this. Friends, watch what you put into your hearts. Watch what you put into your hearts. I've got premium YouTube because I'll, I'll watch a lot of sermons and um, expositional texts on YouTube and stuff. When I run, I run with them and that's my justification. <laughs> Just telling you what's in my heart. But to tell you, must I tell you what else it comes with? It comes with biz news. Alex Hogg. I love Alex Hogg because he speaks to all sorts of people. He's open. He's wide. But let me tell you what. You get more Alex Hogg than you've got of Jesus and the Bible. You'll get depressed at what's going on in this country. So be careful what you put into your heart. 
You can't change those things. You can change what you put into your heart, and you can change your own heart. But all those things out there, you can't change. And then as soon as you get onto a political thing, you get Fox News and CNN and Trump and this thing and that thing. And it's curious and it's exciting and you're thinking and you're wondering. And before you know it, you've spent an hour watching American politics, which has got no bearing on you. And actually, you cannot change a thing. And depending on whether you're red or blue, you're getting depressed or angry or happy. <laughs> and it's determining how you show up at home. And your wife comes to you and says to you, why are you so angry? This obviously wouldn't be me because I'm a pastor. Then it's Israel, Palestine. And we get angrier, depending on where we are on the spectrum. Friends, watch what you put in your hearts. Put the seed of God in your hearts, it'll be fruitful. None of that stuff makes you fruitful. It's not the word of God. It's informative at some level. It's gossip at some level. It's slander at some other level. It's, it's, it's like a little morsel that goes down. It, at some level, it satisfies that. But it's not the word of God, and it will not produce fruit. Watch it. I'm telling you because I know what it does to me. And I'm not the only one. Be careful what you put in your heart. God wants to deal with our hearts. Would you put that picture up, please? You wouldn't mind. Who knows what that is? Any ideas? It's a plumber. The plumbers will say, oh, I know what that is. Gary said a pressure-reducing valve. There we go. It's a pressure-reducing valve. So the idea of that, you see the two threaded ends, you put water at high pressure on the one end, and then there's a mechanism on the inside that reduces the pressure, and then it puts pressure out on the other end at a lower pressure for use at whatever the thing is. That's the idea. Who knows who's been trying to use the, the water machine down there on the right next to training room one and two? And you use it, and it's a nice cold water, and then stops working. It drives me insane. And I'm sure it does you too. For years, we've been trying to fix that thing. We have had the makers of the machine strip it apart and find out why this thing is doing this. We have, we've looked at the filters. We've looked at the size of the pipes. We have done everything. What is wrong with this thing? Why is this thing not filling up? We're looking at all the external factors. Wow. Eventually, I don't know if it was Andre or somebody, opened up the cupboard. So to get into the plumbing of that thing, you've got to open up the built-in cupboard and then get into the back there. And there's one of these things in there. And then Andre gets a, a, a something and he taps it. And the thing fills up. It's amazing. I flip. Didn't even know what that was. Actually, it just was like a metal thing on the pipe. What is, whatever that was. Like the new, that's old school. Like the new, those are like 20 something, that's 20 something years old version. The new one's got like a valve on it and it's like all fancy. And then, oh, okay, we sorted out the problem. And no, shh, runs out. People can't drink. Okay, but now we know a problem here. So what do you do when you've got a problem with pipes and stuff? You call a plumber. But you don't just call any plumber, you call Tim. <laughs> so Tim comes in, turns the water off everywhere. It's a hack. It's like everywhere, turn the water off everywhere because it hasn't got an isolation valve on it. 
So it's a hack. It's irritating. It's like, hey, guys, listen, we're going to be without water for an hour, whatever it is. Turns it off, goes in there, strips it off. It's a mission you flipping, can't see and you can't get in there. Take it off. Take it out. Now, this thing's been there for 20-something years. He's trying to open it and tapping it. He's spraying it with stuff and this thing tapping, tapping, tapping. And like, listen, this is my game. I like, I like this stuff. Like, I'm like, but what are you doing? How are you doing this? What is that thing? How does it work? I'm like, that's my mind, you know? So I'm sitting there watching. Eventually, I'm like, Tim, isn't it just cheaper just to go and buy another one? We're paying for your time here, bro. Like, just go and buy another one. Like, he says, no, 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 no. It's like these things are like a thousand bucks or whatever. I said, okay, well, still got some time. So, <laughs> you know, we, I, mean, I said that to you, Tim. <laughs> Not lying, I'm a pastor. <laughs> so anyway, he goes through it. Eventually, it's then suddenly tapping, tapping, tapping. Like he's got a little hammer, tapping, 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 tapping. Eventually, the one part just screws off, comes out. And eventually, spraying, 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 that part comes up. Ah, flip. And the thing opens up. And in there, there's like a, like a spring, like a little coil with a thing, and, and the, that what happens is when the water comes, the, the adjustment, when you adjust the pressure, that thing moves up and down. The problem is, the, on the outside of that thing, it's full of debris. So that thing is not moving anywhere. It's just stuck. So obviously when Andre goes and taps it, things move a bit and then the water gets through, but then it just, it just doesn't let enough water through. Ah. Oh. Tim, you're a genius, but anyway, and now battling to get this off, battling, trying to get it apart because now it's properly stuck and I eventually, Tim has done this before, For 30 minutes later, hey, Flip, he's got this thing apart, he's cleaning it, he's sanding it, he's working it, he's putting it back together again, and he puts it back together again, works it, puts it back in. And the water fountain's working perfectly. Filling up, you can pull jugs of water in at a time. <laughs> I instantly went and just got jugs of water and just fill it up. <laughs> next one, next one. I'm testing this thing now. I want to check if this thing works, you know? 100%. When I, when I, I realized this, friends, we're talking about the condition of our hearts. You know, you know, God's put in us a pressure release valve, a pressure reducing valve. So the way the Holy Spirit works with us, he's given us Jesus, he's given us love, he's given us the equipment that we can absorb pressure, we can take it on a spring and then spit it out so that people can drink at a good pressure so that the machine can work so that the cooling can happen so that it can function you know what happens with us exactly what happened to that thing over 20 something years little bits of debris get in there and that spring that's meant to move up and down to adjust the pressure stops moving And either nothing comes out or it just comes out full bull. No pressure reduction. In our case, it just didn't come out. It just got stuck. And I felt God say to me, how's your pressure reducing valve, Stan? When the big bull comes, how's your pressure reducing valve? When the irritating person, when, the, when the, this thing happens, when this thing happens on TV, when this whatever, how's your pressure reducing valve? Because you see, that's part of the fruitfulness mechanism of God. He gives us, he gives us an ability to reduce pressure. He gives, us, he gives us some give. He gives us patience. He gives us love. He gives us all 1 Corinthians 13, this is what love is. So that we can continue to love and continue to flow so that people can continue to drink 
of our lives. My question to us is, are you stuck? Was stuck like that for years, friends. It was functioning fine originally, and then got stuck for years. It took a lot of time. It took getting in the back end where you can't access. Difficult to access it. Difficult to get to. Had to be very patient with this thing to undo it and to, to get into the, undo it because it's so clogged up. Friends, that's us. Never been opened before. Never been opened up before. Everybody, when on the outside you think, well, that's a pressure-reducing valve. Doesn't, just because it looks like one doesn't mean it's working. Just because you go to church and do your thing and I'm a Christian doesn't mean working. Fruit is how you recognize whether it's working. So I read those texts. I tell you, friends, in a season of fruitfulness, God wants to take us apart, get rid of all the gunk, put us back together again so that we can flow. So that we can flow wherever we are. But it takes a divine plumber. It takes the, it takes the farming father to come in and do that. I feel like God wants to undo some of our plumbing this morning. You know when it gets stuck like that, that's what causes anxiety. You're out of control. You're stuck. You feel like you've got no control. Just stuck. Stuck with unforgiveness. Stuck with hard hearts. Choked by the deceitfulness of wealth and the soils that are just not healthy. Choked. This morning, God wants to begin a process in you. And I notice I say begin. I would love to say God wants to unclog this morning, forever done. It doesn't normally work like that. It can. But God wants to start a process where he just unbundles our hearts, cleans it out, and begins us to let us flow. So that the fountain of our lives can full, be full and keep flowing. Isn't it incredibly easy to see what's wrong with other people's hearts? And other people's lives? Amazing, eh? Oh, yeah. Incredibly difficult to see what's wrong with our own hearts. That's why God gives me a wife. And God gives me a congregation of people. God gives me an eldership team. God gives me friends. Friends, in this season, don't shy away from God dealing with your heart. Open up your heart. Give God access. Maybe that's my prayer this morning. God, just, that we just give you access. Get into the back cupboards of our lives and just find these things that have been hindering us from flowing all up, maybe all of our lives. Because maybe it's stuck because of something that happened when I was a kid. And I'm 50 years old or 60 years old and still battling with the same thing. Come, friends, come and speak to somebody.
Father, I come before you this morning, Lord God, on behalf of all of us. We are soil, Lord. We want to be good soil. Give you the soil of our hearts, Lord God. Plant your seed deep in our soil, Lord God. We want to be people, Lord God, that know how to be fruitful. We want to be people, Lord God, that just are like living water that just flow with life. pray this morning, Lord God, that every single one of us, nobody excluded, no matter how young no matter how old we are, that we give you access to our hearts, Lord. And that even, Lord, I pray this, that we give some trusted friends access to our hearts, So that we can make that soil ready, Lord God, that we can deepen it, we can soften it, we can get rid of the weeds and the thistles, so that the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth will never choke us. That our eyes would be fixed firmly on you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you are the vine dresser, that you are the gardener. garden with Adam and Eve. You prepared the garden for incredible fruitfulness. You put rivers in there. You put fertile soil in there. You called it a place of pleasure. A place of your pleasure. And you said, take this and take it all over the world. We want to be those people, Lord. We want to take what you've given us all over the world starting in our homes and our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our city and our province and our nation and the nations of the world. Help us flow with fruitfulness, Jesus. Holy Spirit, only you can do this. We can't orchestrate this. You have to can't get into people's hearts. We can get into their heads and manipulate them. But I don't want to do that. I want you to get into their hearts. Pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. I pray, Lord God, the coming times will be the most fruitful times that this church has ever seen. fruitfulness in our lives that we've never experienced ever before. Sing, O Baron. You who never bore a child, shout for joy. Praise Him. For more is your fruitfulness than the one who is already married. 